It should be live in about five seconds here. Oh my goodness. I know. Now Take can we can we still see people's questions and comments and things? Yes. Okay. Because um, I like to be able to see everyone and hear what they would like to say or talk about or any of their input as well. Everybody has so many wonderful things. Uh, to absolutely. Absolutely. There's going to be a little bit of delay on my end because I'll be seeing two different screens, but we'll, we will make it work. My gimpy thumb. That's my thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Where are we here? Thank you for everyone being so patient. I am so grateful for the patience of everyone who has wanted to watch this interview because this is our third platform trying to make it happen. I know. And, and I can see you now and I can talk to you and it's fantastic. Oh, that is awesome. Now, if I can just see where we are on Facebook Live, that would be wonderful. My mom used to say, we're not lost, we're right here. So wherever Absolutely. you are, right here. Here we go. OK, now, now all is good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to this very special live interview featuring my dear friend and more than lupus collaborator, Dr. Lisa Shadburn. We are so thrilled to have her here. You know, uh, when I went to write my special butterfly, I enlisted the help of my dear friend who is a child psychologist, a licensed child counselor, and the president of the California Association of Play Therapy. Her name is Dr. Lisa Shadburn. And with her help, my special butterfly was written as a, a book to help children understand a loved one's life with lupus in a way that's easy for them to follow and very sensitive to their often big, big feelings. And it tells the story of two young siblings, Olivia and Jack, and their thought process as they cope with their mommy's sudden lupus symptoms. Um, there's also a parent guide and example responses in the back of the book and commonly asked questions. And everything from the colors to the feel of the book, to the images, to the wording choices and response examples, to this parent guide were carefully, carefully analyzed by Dr. Lisa. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome her today as she talks in more depth about how to effectively communicate with the little loved ones in your life if you are living with a chronic illness like lupus. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hi, Kelly. It's so happy to be here. I thought that if we were going to talk about my special butterfly, what better than to be in my garden and be outside, although some birds have decided to join us. Hopefully that doesn't lead too much raucous. Um, I'm so happy to be able to talk about this. And when I read your book, uh, and we were going over all of the details, uh, we talked so much about how important this was and how much we need to be able to provide resources for families wanting to explain this to kids, how to connect with their kids. And one of the big things we talked about is a lot of parents who are suffering from a chronic illness, from chronic pain, from anything feel like they have to put on a brave face and pretend everything's okay and hide it from their children in order to protect them. And we know children are very intuitive and they are very in tune with people they love. So that really doesn't work because even if you're trying, you're like, I, I'm okay, I'm really okay. They know when you're hurting and and if right. they don't have an explanation they'll start imagining it and they'll start wondering and start having their own hypotheses of what they think is going on and a lot of times that can be much worse than what's really happening oh. so that's one of the things we talked about is needing to be able to open that dialogue and that's a lot what this book is about being able to open the dialogue and start that conversation I love that because that's one of the things that I learned talking to you uh, when we were working on the book was how to talk very openly and how to be honest. And you encouraged me 
Um, and I hope everyone out there that's going to watch this to be open about that. There's a few times in the book where I somewhat was skating around something and you said, be direct. Um, like in the parent guide, it says, will you feel sick all the time? And you said, no, there are times when I feel sick and there are times when I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. we, ask, we talk about in the parent guide, is lupus contagious? No, lupus is not contagious. So there's this element that was, uh, it was a good reminder to me that you encouraged me, reminded me, is that to always be um, direct with your children. Don't skate around something. Right. Absolutely. It's so important to be direct. And I think one, we've gotten a lot of questions. You did send me a few questions ahead of time. And one of them is how much to tell kids. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of topics, I think one guide is, and, and, and when and how old to start telling kids about this, one guide is when they start to ask questions. Mm -hmm. When they ask you questions, that is when you start talking to them. If, if, if they're not asking and everything seems fine, you can say, you know, mommy's not feeling well today. I'm, I'm going to lie down and then I'll feel better. And something that that's okay to be pretty vague about that. But when they say, mommy, what's wrong? Why are you hurting? mommy, are you going to get better? And they ask those direct questions. It is important to give direct answers. And the amount of information really does depend on their age. For very young children, uh, especially school-aged children, like four, five, and six, they can be very concrete. So if you tell them something, they're going to take it literally. Uh, I remember as a child, somebody saw that I was born in July and said, oh, you're cancer. I walked around for a month thinking I was going to get cancer because they said it and I was terrified. And we don't think about how much kids will hear a word and take that so literally. And mm -hmm. so that's really important to be direct, but you're not going to tell a five-year-old when you're explaining lupus. Well, lupus is an autoimmune disease. And what's happening is my cells are actually attacking the healthy cells. You're not going to go into those details. Right. You're just going to say, I have a condition called lupus and it makes mommy's joints hurt sometimes. And it makes me have to be really careful about the sun. And so I can really do a lot by wearing a hat and wearing sunblock and getting some rest and that's gonna help and then I'll feel better. And so explaining it at their level is gonna be really, really important. For older kids, if they get into more questions, give them more answers. Um, I think a lot of kids really need to know they, they hear of illness and they think of things like cancer and they think that it means you're going to die. And so being able to say, this is something that I will be able to feel better and I'll be able to go and we'll garden again and we'll do all those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll have good days and I'll have bad days. And I think anything you can control, that's gonna be really helpful to be able to say, here's how I can help myself and here's how we can help each other as a family and things like just mentioning the sun, you do have some control there. Anything you do have control over, um, that helps kids feel like they have some control over. So let's make sure we put on our sunblock because that's gonna be a really good thing we can do to protect our skin. So that- no, I, I, I love that so much. And I'm thinking back on how my son, who is now six, how his questions have evolved mm -hmm. even when he was four and starting to pick up on when mommy had surgery or mommy was in the hospital. And then now with him being six, he's made this transition into six where he's very aware when we go to church and we talk about um, God and you know heaven and spiritual things. He's very aware, aware now. He's starting to put the pieces together about death and how our lives come to an end. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of questions about mommy are you going to die if I go to have an infusion or if I go have to go to a doctor's appointment are you going to die so I'm noticing that gosh with every with every stage of development you have to somewhat shift your um your answers yeah and like you said if you're a teenager they can handle more details but even now in the stages of development when they're starting to understand life our our physical bodies don't last forever you know how do you start to explain that to a child who's maybe in first or second or third grade and they're really starting to pick up on um 
their own mortality and right. your own mortality. Right. Absolutely. And if you want to, if you want to know another hint that can help to gauge how much to tell kids, one thing we can do is ask them what they know already. When you have a child, it, you, you have your four-year-old is going to ask different questions than your six-year-old and your eight-year-old. Even six months later, they may have a whole new outlook on things, or they may have seen a TV show or read a book that brought up something in them and made them have more questions. So they may say, you know, if mommy, what is lupus? You say, well, do you, what is your understanding of it? Do you have an idea of what it is? And ask them first. Is it, well, I heard that lupus is, or they may tell you that they, or they may just say, I have no idea. I just heard the word. But you want to get a feel for where they're at and what they've heard so that they can, they can really tell you what they're feeling about it and you can go from there. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, again, we don't want to overburden our children with too much information when they're too young to handle that. The whole idea of an autoimmune condition and, and things like that, that, that can be too much for younger children to understand. Um, but when they get older, they might, you know, mommy, why do you, your joints hurt? What is happening here? And you can start to explain some of that too. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for adults to understand, <laughs> let alone children. Um, another thing, Lisa, too, is a lot of parents fear that their children may feel neglected or somehow gypped if they acknowledge their illness and are open about their illness and are actually upfront about their illness. Mm -hmm. How do you, how would you explain to parents that that's not the case? Well, I think that every parent is trying to make the best decisions they can for their children. And they don't want to make it all about them. They want to make it about their children. They want to make sure their children come first. But I think being able to, again, it goes back to, do you pretend everything's fine when it's really not? So then when you disappear because you, you can't even walk anymore and you need to go lay down, your children don't know what's happening with you, or they think maybe you're mad or you're sad. Well, mommy, I know what happened. Yeah, but they don't have no idea. So bringing them into the loop and being able to say, you know, even, even a parent without a chronic illness who's having a bad day, it's okay to say, you know what, mommy's having a rough day. And one thing I could really use right now is a hug. Would you be able to help me with that? And being able to address that, just like I, we all have rough times for different reasons. And people with, with lupus have more rough times than others. Um, I, I pulled up some, some statistics here. I, when I, I do a lot of workshops for play therapy and child psychology, and we really try to ground everything in theory and in research to be able to show what is out there and make sure you have the latest information. And I was just looking up some of the statistics and I'm sure you know a lot of these as well, Kelly, but um, I found a wonderful literature review that looked at not just lupus, but a lot of of individuals with chronic non-cancerous pain. Mm -hmm. And they estimated that 76.5 million people aged 20 years and over experience pain on a daily basis. And that, that's an astounding number of people. Now, again, when you look at that in terms of parenting, they looked very specifically at the effects that had on children. And some children got a lot of anxiety about it. Some children got depressed. Some children started feeling their own pain and kind of mimicking that. And if, wow. you know, if daddy was getting headaches all the time, they would complain of headaches all the time. And the numbers of that were astounding as the kids that were reporting identical pain. And I think being able to explain it and say, this is what's happening with me. This is why this is happening. And here's how I can help it. Even if it's when I lay down and rest, I can feel better. It's not just a, I have this and there's nothing I can do and it's not gonna go away and I'm stuck and I'm helpless, that will make your kids feel helpless. Being able to explain it and say, here's something we can do about it. Even if it's, uh, I, I look at coping skills, even if it's looking at coping skills that are non-related to the chronic pain or to lupus, things like I, I often, when I work with children in therapy, we make a list of things that make us happy and we can do it in a lot of ways. And this is something families can do it actually 
it addresses two things. One, having family together time, which is so important. And on the days that you're feeling bad and need to lay down, you can let your kids know you need rest. And then on days where you are up and, and feeling better, it's saying, you know what, let's, let's go for a walk or let's play a game together. And during games, you can add, if you're playing a game with colors, you can say every time we land on yellow, let's say something that makes us feel good. And every time we land on green, let's say something we love about our family. I do this with dice games. We'll pick two numbers. Two is something and six is something. And we'll, with my kids, sometimes we'll sing a song or just do something silly that adds more than just the board game. So when you're rolling dice, you're not just moving along a board, you're having some in-depth conversations. And when you have something like making a list of the things that make you feel good, you can make a family list and post it on your refrigerator. And guess what? That list of things that make you happy is also a list of coping skills. For my family, and I know for yours, Kelly, this, this fits you too, singing is a huge stress relief and outlet. And that's on our list. And even as a child, if I was feeling worried or stressed, I would sing. And it just brought me to a new place. So on that note, I wanted to, with, with all my stats and everything, this is what research has shown, that when, when families are affected by chronic pain, the things that help children fare better, that help children be able to come through better and have more resilience are coping skills, like we just talked about, being able to build those coping skills and have ways to cope with any kind of stressful situation. Family cohesion, when the family was close and were, were supporting each other, that helped them through the situation better. Family expressiveness, being able to speak openly about things and being allowed to have your feelings. One thing I do wanna mention, I have worked with um, kids who parents have different types of illnesses and a lot of kids were afraid to show they were sad because they didn't wanna make their parents sad. Not because mm -hmm. they felt like they weren't allowed, they didn't want to cry in front of dad because they didn't want to make daddy sad. And so being able to say, you know what, we get sad sometimes and it's okay if we cry together and that they're not making other people sad by crying. It, it, they're just letting it out and we all, we all have those feelings sometimes. So family expressiveness was another one. Another thing that helped families through these situations or helped families fare better was participation and recreation. Being able to do things, a lot of times when people are stressed and they're and right now, my gosh, with the pandemic and COVID and you should have seen my morning with Zoom meetings that I had a seven-year-old in tears because she couldn't log in. And then when she did, she didn't know what was going on. The teacher couldn't hear because of tech problems and she was stressed out of her mind. Mm -hmm. And when those happen, you're not thinking, okay, let's go play ball. You're like, okay, how do we deal with all these problems? But being able to take some time and do some family activities, whether it's games or playing ball or going swimming or anything you can do together, family dance parties are really fun. Um, that was another one. And um, the parent-child relationship and positive parenting, parenting skills. So in the research, those are the things that are shown when you have a child who is dealing with a parent with chronic pain having those things in place will help them fare better and help them be able to build the resilience to get through it. I love that so much. Uh, you know, Lisa, a lot of parents and caregivers, including myself, can feel guilty. Mm -hmm. We have to take time to rest yes. and take time for self-care with our lupus, or maybe it's another chronic condition. I mean, I know that's something that I always struggle with is feeling guilty for not doing the family event or staying home or having to take time to rest. But you say it's, it really is the opposite. So that's one of the things that's mentioned in the parent guide in the book. Can you elaborate on that? I think one of the most important things that a parent can do in any situation but one of the most overlooked things that parents can do is self-care. Mm -hmm. Being able to take care of yourself and know that doing things to help your own physical health, your own mental health, it is 
the opposite of selfish because you are you need to be a whole person to be able to take care of your child. The, the, the standard example is that oxygen mask. You're not being selfish by putting your own on first. You cannot help your child if you can't breathe. So you need to be able to help your child by helping yourself first. And not only are you helping to get yourself back in better physical, um, getting your rest, getting back physical shape or better mental health state, you're also modeling that for them. Mm -hmm. That when you are having a hard day, whether it's because of physical pains or emotional pains, this is what you can do to help. Um, for me, cuddles with my kids are priceless. There are days that there is nothing I can do or say, but I just need a hug. Mm -hmm. And I have a little one who's very, very sensitive to a lot of things. And when she gets flooded, when she gets emotionally flooded, talking to her in that moment is not going to be as effective until I sit with her in a rocking chair and we just have a very close cuddle and take some time to just get ourselves back. And then we can have the talk that we need to. But in that moment, sometimes just being able to be there for each other, that physical affection, the hugs, the cuddles, um, back scratches, things like that can just be very relaxing. I even have, and you could call this very selfish, or you can call this, you know, helping my kids and helping me. I love when my daughter brushes my hair and she loves to play hair salon. So it's win-win, you know? And honestly, sometimes just sitting, I'll be like, okay, this is what I need right now, you know? And it reminded me of when I was a child and my mom would brush my hair. And, and the flip side, my daughter gets very sensitive of me brushing her hair, so she doesn't like it as much. So we've learned that, but she loves to brush mine. So it's kind of a, it's just a thing to bring you close. And I'm not saying, okay, there's your, there's your prescription, go brush each other's hair, but it's find out what is soothing for you and what is soothing for your children and what will be something that will bring you close. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. What do you think is, I don't wanna say the word mistake because we're all works in progress, but what do you think is the biggest misstep um, mm -hmm. when people are trying to communicate with their children about their, um, chronic illness or lupus? Well, one of them we hit on already, which is, which is pretending everything's fine. Um, on one hand, kids will know it's not true. On another hand, they may feel like you're lying to them. So that is yeah. a misstep and, and they may, you know, well, mom says she's fine, but I know she's lying, you know, that kind yeah. of thing, especially when they get older. I think another one is you, you want to be able to share with them what's going on in a language they'll understand without divulging too much information or going into too many details. Because again, with a chronic illness, um, having all the details might get really scary. If you explain that your cells are attacking your own healthy cells to a five-year-old, that could be terrifying. The, the ideas that might go through their head of what, what is happening that could be really scary. So again, being able to share information without going into too much detail. Often that's why I ask that question of what do you know already? What are, you, what are your ideas? Can you tell me what your thoughts are about this? And ask for their thoughts first and then take that as your starting point and elaborate enough to be able to explain things, but without going into too much detail. That is such a great starting point, no matter what age they are they're five or if they're 10 or if they're 15, what do you think lupus is? And, and, it, and it, is an interesting, it is an interesting thing because a 15 year old often we'd say, oh, well, they understand things. There are so many adults who don't understand what lupus is. And, and I know so much more from being involved with you and, and going to your lupus lives. And I've done a lot of my own research now to learn more. And when I was helping with the book, I wanted to make sure I was very well versed because I've worked with a lot of kids whose parents have had illness, but not necessarily lupus. Mm -hmm. So it was something that I wanted to know as much as possible about. But I have friends who I was talking about this and they had they had no idea. Like, I, I, I heard that, but I don't know what it is. And the yeah. other thing, um, 
I, I, I know you've touched on this in your Lupus Live and talked about it with, um, with some of the books you recommend, but there is this thought that lupus in some way is an invisible disease in that someone can say, I'm, I'm really hurting today. And other people who don't understand, oh, you're fine. You look fine. There's nothing wrong with you. And so that guilt can be even more. And, um, and someone that I do know very well now is dealing with that, that trying to say, okay, I'm not feeling well enough to do this today and having people think you're lying because you just want to get out of going somewhere or something like that. Right. To have them understand that this is not an excuse. This is where I'm at right now right. and I need to take care of myself. And so a 15 year old may be able to have that conversation with you that, yeah, you don't look very sick right now, but right now you may on the inside just be in severe pain. So that's, that's a big difference with lupus than other, than other conditions and other situations people might find themselves in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And what is one thing that you would say to those living with lupus who have a little loved one in their life? Oh, your, just one thing. Of, <laughs> just one thing. Like if, well, one, one of your top tips, I guess. Well, to borrow from you, I mean, you are more than lupus. This, you are a person with lupus, but that doesn't define you. Um, and the whole point, the point of your book and the whole point of a lot of the things we're talking about is this doesn't define you. It is something that you need to help your kids understand. It's something that's having you modify your lifestyle in a way. And it's something that you are going to have to monitor and you're dealing with, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't make you less of a person. And for what we were just talking about, if you do need to go rest, you're not letting your kids down. You are, you need to take care of yourself and take care of your kids. And, and this, I can, everybody watching, I can tell you, Kelly is a testament to this, is that when you do have that time with your children, you make the absolute most of it. Mm -hmm. You appreciate them. You are grateful for the moments together and you let them know that. I, uh, every night when I put my kids to bed, I tell them how lucky I am to be their mom. And I am 100% truthful about that. I am so grateful to have them. And you know that your time together is a gift and you make the absolute most of it. I love that. Now, one of my favorite times of day, probably my favorite time of day, actually, not one of the most favorite time of day is story time where we all crawl into Luca's bed, um, me and my husband, and we do two, three different stories. We take turns reading them, but we can lay there. We use our soft voices. We're quiet. We're calm. We're all three snuggled up right before Luca's eyes start to close. And we're off in storyland. And it doesn't take any energy from me to lay there. In fact, it's nice and peaceful and relaxing to me. But that physical touch that he gets, the attention he gets, the unity of the three of us being together, ending every single day together, just makes me so happy. It's just finding those little moments when you are dealing with a chronic illness like lupus and you are in pain and you can't maybe be as physical as you hope to be sometimes. Those are the moments that they're going to remember when they're older. Those Absolutely. Of making that time as a family a priority. Not the big expensive trips to here, there, or wherever. Um, but those moments where we made that a priority every single day. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you. That is the little things. You don't need to do extravagant things to get close to your children. Cuddle time, um, painting rocks, something we've been doing while we're home. You know, we've been, we've been doing all kinds of things and all of those things. You know, and even when you're looking at um, living a grateful life, which is one thing that I really try to teach my children to be grateful for what you have for each other. And we've been painting rocks with words of gratitude and leaving them out on our front lawn. So there, there are things you can do with your kids that just bring you close and help you maintain that positive outlook on life. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, again, you, you are someone who is living with lupus, but it's not defining you and it's not taking away your spirit. And it doesn't mean you're less of a person and you are going to make the most of all the time you have and the time with your kids and let them know that they are a priority. You know, they are, they are special and that you're grateful for every moment you have with them. Mm -hmm. And that they are loved and that they are safe. Yes. Yeah. Now, I just want to thank you so much. Was there something else you wanted to add? You want to catch up? Did. I had something really special, but I wanted to call over my kids. It's like really, really special, but I'm going to mute myself for one moment so I can call them over and see if they'll help me with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, are they here? You won't, you won't believe this. Um, talking about my special butterfly and how you know we're out in the garden. One of the things I thought I wasn't even thinking about doing this today, but it's so fitting. One oh. of the things that we have started doing, um, and it's on a fluke. Uh, we have been raising butterflies in my house. So awesome. <laughs> so. It started because uh, I, I wanted to treat myself for my birthday. I bought myself milkweed. The monarch butterflies came, they brought their caterpillars or they laid eggs and we were so thrilled. And then they were all eaten by predators. It's very sad. Um, wasps ate all of our caterpillars. So we learned that actually in the wild, only 10% of monarch butterflies live from egg to butterfly. So my kids really wanted to help the butterflies and we started finding eggs and bringing them inside. And to date, we have raised and released over 20 butterflies in the past month and a half. And we happen to have here. So this is our, our latest two little babies here. These are actually just about to, uh, they're Maybe pretty chrysalis. close to getting in the chrysalis. So this is, this is light bright. You wanna take light bright? This is light bright. So you hold them up to the camera so people can, oh, there you go, right there. Yeah. There's light bright. I can't wake <laughs> him up. That's He's okay, asleep. he can sleep, he can sleep. So, there you go, bud. There you go. So we have some caterpillars. But the reason that I'm showing them right now is that this morning during our Zoom meeting, which was kind of stressful today, so this was kind of a neat thing, the kids kind of jumped out of their Zoom meetings for a few minutes because. We had two butterflies that hatched today. And we thought maybe you guys could be here with us when we release one. Let's see. I am going to take this here. I'll bring this. So this is my butterfly habitat here. They sell these butterfly habitats and they're these tiny little net things and we wanted to give them more room. So, all right. Wow, look at that. Baby. So what I do is I just go put my hand under his legs so that he crawls on my finger. And then we can introduce you to our new friend. Wow. There he is. Hello. So, Julian, will you put this on the ground? There we go. So, what we do is we have them here. These just hatched this morning. You can't release them right away. You can't release them right away because their wings are wet. So, we wait until their wings dry and then take him outside. And I just hold him gently until he decides to fly away. A so special I moment. I want to introduce you to our special butterfly. Oh, I love it. Right now. So we're just gonna hang out with him until he flies away. <laughs> so there you have it. So he doesn't wanna go anywhere. Um, we had, most of them have stayed maybe a minute and then flown off. 
some oh. had one that stayed with us for an hour. We set him down on a flower and he just kind of hung out. So that is so wonderful. Wow. So and um, it's actually been such a joy for us to know when our kids saw how many of them were getting eaten and we brought them inside and now have been mm -hmm. raising them all to be healthy. Oh, happy butterflies. <laughs> we are, so we have two to release today. That is so, so cool. Okay, oh goodness. There you are. So special. <laughs> and there you go. So thank you for having me on today. <laughs> It's been a joy to talk to you, and it's been, I mean, let's put our hands a little lower. There we go. There. Hi, baby. I know. Here, I'm just going to show so everybody can see how beautiful you are. Wow, they're so beautiful. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you for um, being so patient with the little technology glitches and um, doing it this way. I think this is going to be even cooler because now it's recorded and other people can watch this later and if they couldn't join us live. Um, as always, Lisa, I cherish your friendship and your insightfulness. And anytime I need you, you are there. Um, you have been a dear friend for me for to me for over 15 years. And I'm uh, so thankful that we have you as such an incredible resource to those that are living with chronic illness and how to effectively communicate with the little loved ones in their life. And um, I haven't said this publicly enough. Thank you again for your help with the book um, and all that you've done to help this be a successful book. Um, but most importantly, thank you for your friendship. Love you. I love your beautiful girls. It's, it's, I'm so glad that you brought me on. I'm so glad we were able to talk about this and thank you for all the work you are doing. I know, oh, and there he goes. Oh. And on that note, <laughs> and he, and yeah, so I think a lot of them we released have stayed around to lay some eggs and we now wow, have- Wow, that's so neat. Wow. Wow. So cool, so cool. <laughs> so yes, thank you for all you're doing. And um, I know that you have brought support and light. <gasps> I wish he could show you. He's flitting around up above and oh, so cool. Right <laughs> so yes, you got to be with us to release two more butterflies. Oh wow. But you bring support so and light to so many people. So thank you for all you're doing. And thank you for having me as part of your talk today. Oh hi butterfly. <laughs> oh, and what I always like to say to all the special butterflies out there, it's the butterfly, not the wind, that determines how high it soars. So soar high today, butterflies. And uh, thank you again, Lisa. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, thank you, everybody who's been watching. And we appreciate all your questions. We appreciate all of you. And I have been sitting in the lupus live chats for a while and I love all the support that you're giving to each other. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Good Misty. Bye. <laughs> now I just have to and light bright says bye too. No, because it kicked me off, but that's okay. Just give me a second. <laughs> Here we go. Juliana just put him on my finger. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. <laughs> okay, I stopped it recording. Well, everybody, oh, and everybody out there who's watching live, thank you for bearing with us. Kelly does not give up. Kelly will find a way. Kelly will make it happen. No, seriously. Now that it's kicked me out of my original um, window, now I have to go back and close. Mm -hmm. 
And sometime you'll have to give me a tutorial on how to let me in on Instagram because it was just not giving me any options. Oh, I know. It was. I figured it out. Meetings. Ha 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 There you go. <laughs> and now. I think now is when we sing a song. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs>